start, I'm uh, pleased to invite Nick Stone uh, from Hebrew University, uh, who did his PhD in Harvard and postdoc in Columbia University, and then he moved to Jerusalem, and since then, um, from 2019, it's there. And he will talk about tidal dis disruption events. Please. All right. Uh, I, I think we may want to mute this to prevent feedback. But I'll, I'll step aside from that for a second. And uh, I'll just say thank you guys for the invitation. It's a pleasure to come down here. And I'm very excited to talk to the whole physics department about uh, a special class of astrophysical explosions in the sky, which has always been a favorite of mine to study. My original motivation for studying these tidal disruption events, layers of radiation produced when unlucky stars come too close to supermassive black holes, is more on the astrophysical side. But as time has gone on, I think astronomers have increasingly realized that there are fundamental physics applications of tidal disruption events as well, and novel ways that these can be used to test aspects of general relativity and, and even particle physics. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited to talk about all of this today. I should also mention that uh, after I, I got this invite, I, I emailed my, my collaborator, Yair, and, and told him I would be coming back to, to Tel Aviv for the first time since, um, since February 2020. And to be honest, I, I was expecting a somewhat warmer reception from Yair. And instead, as you can see, there was a little bit of skepticism. But as all of you know, Yair is a very talented empiricist who's, who's very perceptive at recognizing trends. So I'm, I'm going to point out the, the timestamp on his email and then, then direct your attention to the, the Wikipedia page for the, the Omicron variant, as well as uh, developments you may have read about in the, in the news since then. So, so really all I have to say is I'm, I'm happy to be back here, but, but hopefully. <laughs> um, I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just trying to be as much of an empiricist as Yair. Okay, uh, so the, 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 the setting or the, the theme for this talk will be, will be black holes, which uh, are the, ultimately the forces that power these, these flares of radiation, these tidal disruption events that, that I'll be talking about. And one very nice thing about black holes from an astrophysical perspective is, is just how incredibly simple they are. So in classical general relativity, neglecting any sort of quantum extension to, to gravity, uh, a black hole is really the simplest macroscopic object you can think of in the universe. To make a, a stellar mass black hole, something the, the size of the sun that's been shrunk down to be about the, the radius of Jerusalem, more or less, you're taking all uh, 10 to the... 57 baryons in the sun and compressing them into a, a much smaller volume that the, the external space time of which is ultimately defined by just three numbers, the mass M, the spin angular momentum S, and the electric charge Q. And as an astronomer, I really have it even simpler than this because astrophysical black holes don't live in perfect vacuum. They live in this very low density interstellar medium. And if they ever did have any sort of significant charge, they would quickly neutralize themselves by selectively accreting plasma of the opposite sign from interstellar uh, matter. So an astrophysical black hole is, is an even simpler macro, uh, macroscopic object. It's characterized just by two numbers, its mass and its spin. And for the remainder of this talk, I will refer to its spin as this dimensionless number A, uh, which if, uh, if the black hole is really a well-behaved black hole with an event horizon, has to be less than one in its magnitude. If it's more than one, unusual things will start to happen. We'll talk about that later on. Now, for the non-astronomers in the audience, I, I think it's probably useful to just go over a quick background or primer on the, the different varieties of black holes that we, that we have in our universe. Let me see if this uh, clicker works. Okay, very good. So um, the, the, the first kind of black hole are the so-called stellar mass black holes. These have masses between a few times the mass of our own sun up to maybe 60 or 50, 60, 70 times the mass of our own sun. It's a little hard to set a firm upper limit on this, although there is a, a physical motivation. These black holes are uh, re reasonably well understood. They're thought to form from the explosive deaths, the supernovae, that terminate the lives of stars significantly more massive than our own. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we have the so-called supermassive black holes, which I will sometimes abbreviate as SMBHs in this talk. These are uh, rarer objects. They have masses between about a million and uh, 10 billion times the mass of our own sun. You may have noticed that there's a bit of a mass gap, and in fact, astronomers have searched for decades 
For the elusive so-called intermediate mass black holes, or IMBHs, these have been conjectured to exist for many theoretical reasons for a long time, and intermittently there are claims of detection of uh, uh, an intermediate mass black hole in some sort of star cluster in the center of a dwarf galaxy. These claims are often controversial. Today I will have the pleasure of, of uh, making my own claim about the existence of intermediate mass black holes as illuminated by, by tidal disruption events, but we'll, we'll come back to that later on. One interesting thing about the, the mass spectrum of black holes is that these supermassive black holes, which live in the centers of galaxies, have an origin that is entirely unknown. Every galaxy seems to have one, and in most cases only one, supermassive black hole. It sinks to the center of the galaxy's potential well, and is responsible for a number of important processes, like the, the emission of high energy jets and radiation that can be seen in this X-ray and radio image of Centaurus A, a nearby galaxy whose supermassive black hole is surrounded by a very dense disk of interstellar gas. Uh, theorists have different ideas about the origins of supermassive black holes. I have my own favorite theories, but suffice it to say, there, there's really no consensus here yet. Uh, uh, on the other hand, stellar mass black holes, as I said a minute ago, their origins are, are relatively well understood. Uh, and, and they're also very common. Every galaxy has of order millions of them. Now, the outline for the rest of this talk is sort of split into two parts. First, I'm going to turn all of you into theoretical astrophysicists who understand the, the basic pieces of physics related to these tidal disruption events, which are illustrated in cartoon form here. The overall motivation for studying tidal disruption events goes back decades, and the basic appeal is that these are potentially very clean probes of the, the space-time and the parameters of supermassive black holes. And the reason I say they're potentially clean probes is that unlike a lot of other phenomena, that occur around black holes in our universe, a, super uh, a tidal disruption event, excuse me, is something that's governed by a relatively small number of free parameters. We have an unlucky star. It approaches the black hole on roughly a parabolic orbit. Once it gets within what's called a tidal disruption radius, essentially the radius where the black hole's tides overwhelm the star's own self-gravity, the star is torn apart. It's spaghettified into these very long, very eccentric debris streams half of which are gravitationally bound to the supermassive black hole and eventually return to pericenter and begin dissipating their orbital energy, turning it into heat, and then radiating that heat off to infinity to power this, this ultra-luminous electromagnetic flare. But the overall setup for this problem to leading order is really governed just by four free parameters, the mass and spin of the supermassive black hole, the pericenter of the victim star, and the mass of the star that gets torn apart. It's important that also black holes couldn't be having the same kind of phenomena with Newton's stuff. Great, great question. So, so in principle, the same exact thing can happen as long as the, the object doing the disrupting is something denser than the star that's being torn apart. Whether or not the star gets torn apart, whether tides overwhelm its own gravity, is essentially a criterion on density. Is the star less dense, more diffuse than the object it's encountering? Uh, in practice, however, these, these so-called micro-tidal disruption events, things involving, very, uh, things involving low mass compact objects like stellar mass black holes or neutron stars or even white dwarfs, I, I don't think there's firm observational evidence that they've been seen yet. Theorists sometimes think about the consequences of this, but the tidal disruption events that observers like, like Yair collect data on overwhelmingly seem to be from massive black holes, usually supermassive, maybe sometimes intermediate mass. Good question. Thank you for that. Uh, so in the first part of this talk, uh, in, the, in, in the epistemological framework of Donald Rumsfeld, I'm going to try to break down what astronomers uh, know or, or think we know about tidal disruption events into the category of, of known knowns and known unknowns. So I'll, I'll try to be as honest as I can about what aspects of the tidal disruption process we think we understand very well and which aspects are, are more in the realm of open questions things where we, we might have a theory, but maybe there's a competing theory as well. There are also, of course, unknown unknowns, sort of by definition, I can't tell you about these, but if you think you know what they are, you should come tell me after the talk. Then in the second part of this talk, after you've all been acquainted with the astrophysics of tidal disruption events, I'm going to move on to different ways, uh, most of which are relatively novel, things that people have thought about only in the last few years, <clears throat> in which these tidal disruption events, or, or TDEs is the acronym I, I will slip into, at ways in which these TDs can be used as astrophysical laboratories to test more fundamental questions in physics as well. I'll start with a, 
a, a brief digression into astroparticle physics, how tidal disruption events may be related to the origin of high energy neutrinos and high energy cosmic rays that are increasingly detected here on Earth. Then I'll discuss two uh, sort of more basic questions related to the cosmic censorship hypothesis and classical general relativity and the existence of a wide class of ultralight bosons in certain theories of, of particle physics beyond the standard model. Uh, and then I'll, I'll summarize uh, very briefly. So uh, as, as I said a second ago, tidal disruption events, TDs, have been studied theoretically at least for, for many decades, I guess half a, half a century now. They were first theoretically proposed in the, in the early 1970s uh, and the, the level of theory varied. Sometimes there were, there were detailed models constructed. Sometimes there were more approximate models constructed as you, as you can see in this classic cartoon, which, which I love. But uh, TDEs really moved from the realm of, of theory into empirically testable <coughs> observations in the 1990s when the first candidate tidal disruption flares were seen in the nuclei of uh, quiescent galaxies with, um, with X-ray observations with the ROSAT instrument, uh, with the ROSAT spacecraft. In the present day, the rate of detection has accelerated and it's really picked up in the last few years with the advent of, of wide field time domain astronomy. Current detection rates are sort of a mix until very recently they were dominated by wide field optical surveys like ZTF and Assassin. More recently, the German Russian X ray satellite Erosita has begun detecting tidal disruption events in the X rays at a very impressive rate. And in the near future, probably just in the next few years, our sample size is going to increase by about two, two more orders of magnitude thanks to the deployment of, of two new instruments. Uh, on the ground, there's the LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory, a very wide field, very deep optical survey telescope currently being built in, in South America. And one thing that I think is, is very exciting for, for this audience, or at least for me, is the planned uh, Israeli ultraviolet satellite, survey satellite, Ultrasat, which I believe is, is currently scheduled for a 2024 launch and which will revolutionize our view of the time domain or variable ultraviolet sky. Both of these missions, instruments, are expected to detect of order a thousand tidal disruption events every year. So there, there's going to be a, a flood of data in the near future. It behooves theorists like myself to try and get our act together and, and make sure we have models that will be able to keep up with all of this. Okay, um, to give you a sense of what the observations are telling us already, here's uh, a nice compilation of the, the light curves, the time domain evolution of about uh, 15 or 20 tidal disruption events. This is taken from a recent review article by Shor Van Belzen and Yair. It, it is also being published in a, a textbook I will, I will advertise later in this talk. What you can see in this figure is on the x-axis, we have time measured in days since the discovery of the flare. On the y-axis, we have the, the logarithmic luminosity of the flare in units of ergs per second. You can see a fast rise and a slow, generally power law decay. If you're an astronomer, you might look at the units on the, x -ax the y-axis and see that these are actually very bright flares. Their bolometric luminosities are higher than all except the, the very brightest supernova explosions. So they really uh, can, be dis they can be discovered to cosmological distances, the main limiting factor is just how uncommon they are. In an average galaxy, it's only once every 10,000 years when the supermassive black hole tears apart a passing star. So these are not very common on a per galaxy basis, but with modern observational equipment, we can stare at many galaxies at the same time and detect interesting numbers of these. The light curves on the left are really sort of black body fits to optical and, and near ultraviolet observations. But one thing I should emphasize is that Tidal disruption events are very multi-wavelength flares if you have the ability to look at them across the electromagnetic spectrum. So, so far they've been detected in everything from radio wavelengths all the way up to soft gamma rays. Their brightest emission usually seems to be in optical and near ultraviolet bands where there's evidence for a, a sort of large scale quasi-thermal emitting photosphere and also in soft X-ray wavelengths where you're seeing the <laughs> V-metal of quasi-thermal emission coming from much closer to the event horizon of the supermassive black hole. So the, the cartoon picture you can have in your head is that there's some sort of inner inflow and accretion flow in at least a subset of tidal disruption events, which produces this quasi-thermal X-ray radiation, whereas at much larger scales, maybe scales of a thousand event horizon, you have some sort of more ambiguous sur surface, some sort of more ambiguous photosphere, which we still don't fully understand, that powers the optical and ultraviolet radiation from, from these TDs. Now, 
Uh, to give you um, good question, the the thermal emission seems to be quasi isotropic. There may be some viewing angle effects, especially with being able with the extended structure being able to block the the X rays from the inner disk. But I think the emission, at least, is is quasi isotropic. They, they might get absorbed along the way. A small subset of TDs launch powerful relativistic jets. The emission from those is highly anisotropic, but that appears to be less than 10% of all tidal disruption events. Thanks for the question. Okay, so far I've, I've been talking, I've been showing you observations, but to give you a, a slightly better sense of what goes on in the TD, this is a, a modern state-of-the-art radiation hydrodynamic simulation done by my colleague Elad Steinberg at, at the Hebrew University. Uh, in the beginning of the simulation, which is centered on the rest frame of the star, you can, you can see the star go from a, a spherical hydrostatic equilibrium into this enormous spaghettified debris stream as it passed the black hole and was, was ripped apart by its tides. Now we're shifting into the lab frame, the, the rest frame of the supermassive black hole, was it, which is at the origin of this coordinate system. And we see the most tightly bound stellar debris come back to pericenter, pass pericenter, fly out to a large distance again, and begin interacting with other stellar debris that hasn't returned yet. The simulation stops here appropriately enough because this is basically where our very firm understanding of tidal disruption events comes to an end. The disruption process and the spaghettification process, we think we understand these quite well. They're simple analytic models you can write down. They agree very well with these nonlinear 3D hydrodynamic simulations. But after this elongated elliptic stellar debris stream, begins interacting with itself, that's when the picture becomes very complicated. Uh, and there, there, are a couple, there, there are a few different open questions, which I uh, unfortunately can't have time to do justice to today, but I, I, I certainly will mention at least briefly. One of the biggest open questions in the theory of TDs is how do these very eccentric debris streams circularize into something more like a classic quasi-circular axisymmetric accretion disk? Usually when astronomers think about accretion power around black holes. Black holes in vacuum are black, but if you put them in a gaseous or, or plasma rich medium, they are able to become the power sources for some of the, the, brightest, uh, the, the brightest lights in the electromagnetic sky. And the reason for this is that gas or plasma orbiting a black hole gives up enormous amounts of, uh, of gravitational binding energy as it slowly inspirals and sinks deeper and deeper into the potential well of the black hole. That potential energy is thermalized, it becomes heat, and then it radiates. Something similar happens, at least in the subset of tidal disruption events that have quasi-thermal X-ray radiation. At least in the X-ray bright subset of TDs, we know that matter is able to assemble itself into something like a traditional accretion disk at small scales around the event horizon. But how it does this, and whether this happens in all TDs or just a minority of them, is still a matter of debate. <clears throat> Go ahead. So, so just uh, from a logical point of view, uh -huh. you know, you're, you're saying, well, you expect stars to be uh, ripped apart and circularized. And then you ask, well, how do we know that how they circularize? I mean, you, you, you just, you know, it was all theoretical. You don't see the circular orbits or anything, right? So you're just assuming they're there. Um, so, and you're assuming it because you're led to expect to expect it theoretically. I I, I see your point, but I I, I, I disagree, and, and it, it's very possible I explain myself poorly. So let me try again. Um, it, it is very true that the major bottleneck in our theoretical understanding of TDs is the lack of ab initio simulations that have very realistic parameters. I'll get to that in just a slide or two. There are simulations people have done, myself included, which are idealized in various ways. And when we do these idealized, computationally cheaper simulations, we sometimes see circularization of the debris, sometimes we don't. But this is an idealization, maybe we shouldn't trust it. On the other hand, we do see in an order unity fraction of TDs, the quasi-thermal X-ray radiation that, as far as I'm aware, can only be fit by some sort of quasi-standard accretion disk sitting on scales of a few Schwarzschild radii. Uh, I, I've been unable to come up with an alternative model for this. As, as far as I know, no one else has proposed one. And the spectra we ultimately see are very similar to a scaled up version of the spectra in, for example, the soft state of an X-ray binary. So 
Uh, well, where there are two, nobody has really seen it. You know, nobody has really seen the accretion. Um, it's a theoretical construct that reproduces. But I'm I'm just being sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you 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 can definitely play uh, devil's advocate to a to a greater and greater extent. But I I, I guess my my main motivation for saying at least sometimes we see circularization is uh, that the emission we see, and I'm, I'm not just talking about the spectra, but also the bulk energetics appears to be consistent with radiatively efficient accretion of uh, a large fraction of a stellar mass. Often, uh, often it appears that much less than a stellar mass accretes, but at least in a subset of TDs, the total integrated energy that we see come out is consistent with radiatively efficient accretion of 0.1 stellar masses. The spectrum looks something like the classic soft state of a multicolored black body accretion disk. There are other ways related to variability that also appear to support the accretion picture, not for the optical and UV emission, but, but for the, the thermal X-ray emission. I just want to be even more provocative than that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask a provocative question. So I apologize in advance. Okay. Right. And it's also important to explain to the physicists. I mean, how do you actually, how sure are you that this whole phenomenon has anything to do with a star being? Um, excellent question. So tidal disruption events are rare transients, rare explosions in the sky. And one thing that preoccupied people who studied them, especially observers, for the first 10 or 20 years of their study was making sure that we weren't falling into some kind of trap like what you described, that we weren't confusing some outliers from a much more common class of transients with this theoretical phenomenon we wanted to find. I think at this point, we have a number of different lines of evidence that all point in the same direction. We have a class of generally consistent optical UV, sometimes X-ray flares that only come from galactic nuclei. Their time evolution and their, their color evolution look completely different from the, the kinds of supernovae we know about. These are often detected in, these are generally detected in quiescent galactic nuclei, which show no evidence, either archival or in terms of narrow lines for AGN activity. Um, the single most compelling piece of evidence, though, is it involves about three or four minutes of general relativistic dynamics, and I'm going to come back to it later in the talk. So, so hold your question for about half an hour. I promise I will I will come back to it later. I think there really is a, a smoking gun in in the nice predictions of general relativity. Uh, I'm telling you, this thing general relativity, right? I, I, the phenomena that, according to general relativity, should appear, soon the general relativity tells you some characteristic of this uh, event, and that, then you have to look for it. So. That, that, that's exactly what I'm going to come to later in the talk. A lot of the observable features of TDs are governed by hydrodynamics and curved space time, which is very messy, and it's sometimes hard to see the signatures of general relativity. But there's one particular signature of GR which is very unmistakable. And that's what I'll come to in about half an hour. Thanks for the questions. Okay, um, so in, in addition to how and, and whether the eccentric debris from the shredded star can circularize, there are other important open questions as well, such as what is the power source for the observed optical UV photosphere? Theorists don't fully agree on this. Some think that it's reprocessed high energy radiation from an inner accretion disk on the scale of the event horizon. Others think that it's due to shocks between the debris streams themselves. There are other questions, which uh, I won't have time to go into, related to the, the stellar dynamical processes that scatter stars onto the very radial orbits that result in their disruption. But the, the fundamental problem, the reason that, especially on the emission side and the hydro side, we, we don't fully understand TDs yet, is really related to the computational challenge of simulating these from first principles. And I'll illustrate this challenge with another uh, set of pretty movies. So this is a general relativistic hydrodynamic simulation, this time no radiation transport, uh, done by my collaborator, Zach Andelman at, at Yale, which I think is the single most, uh, <laughs> I'm a little biased, I, I think it is the single most realistic simulation of a TD done so far in the published literature. And the reason that there aren't a lot of these is the huge dynamic range of the problem. The star is torn apart at a radius of about 10 Schwarzschild radii. Its bound debris flies out to a radius of thousands of Schwarzschild radii. Uh, 
it maintains this very narrow aspect ratio along the way that needs to be resolved. It's this thin, dynamically cold string of spaghetti. And then you have a lot of uh, nonlinear hydro phenomena like shocks happening at pericenter, happening elsewhere, all of which need to be resolved. <laughs> In the past, sort of building on my answer to Danny's question, the way that people have studied these hydrodynamically is by cheating in various ways, using stars on unrealistic orbits, using intermediate mass black holes rather than supermassive black holes, finding parameter choices and tweaks that allow them to reduce the dynamic range of the problem. With the modern generation of hydro, of hydro and radiation hydrocodes, I think we are finally getting close to self-consistent simulations. And indeed, there have been no approximations made in this one here. But the, the downside of, of this simulation is it only runs for the first six days after mass returns to pericenter. So it's making predictions for part of the light curve, but only, uh, only a pretty small part. Okay. Um, with regards to the optical and UV emission that is the primary way in which TDs are detected these days, uh, we had a lot of questions, so I'll have to go a little quickly through this, but the, the, the two main theories are reprocessing theories, which invoke circularization of a subset of the stellar debris. It settles into an accretion disk and emits a huge amount of ionizing radiation, X-ray and extreme ultraviolet. This ionizing radiation is intercepted by poorly circularized or outflowing debris at scales of thousands or tens of thousands of Schwarzschild radii. It's absorbed by this less bound material and it re-radiates at a colder temperature, which powers the optical and UV light curves we see. On the other hand, there's a, a different paradigm involving shocks. As the, the most tightly bound debris passes pericenter and flies back out to apocenter again, it intersects less tightly bound material that's coming back for the first time. This point of intersection creates a powerful shock wave that thermalizes the kinetic energy of the orbit. That thermalized kinetic energy can be radiated then and there at a self-intersection point, which is often naturally of order of thousands of Schwarzschild radii. So, Right now, we don't know which of these is the, the dominant power source for the optical and UV radiation of TDs. My own uh, speculation, as, as someone who's worked on both, is that I, I, I suspect that reprocessing dominates in one part of parameter space and shock power dominates in another part, but this is just a, a speculation. Both like the five thirds? Say again? They both get five thirds? There, there aren't, I, I, I would not say there are totally self-consistent models to, to make that prediction yet. Ad hoc models for these processes can be tuned to give this classic power law decay of the luminosity, T to the minus five thirds, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would trust them well enough to take that as a, a real prediction rather than a post-diction yet. You, you can see one such model. This, this is one I made with Brian Metzger a few years ago in the context of wind reprocessing, but we had to make fairly strong assumptions about the, the geometry and the, the hydrodynamics of the outflowing material to make a simple semi-analytic model like this one. Okay, so uh, uh, overall, I, I think, hopefully I've, I've convinced you that while TDs have tremendous scientific potential, they're a way to measure the demographics, by which I mean the masses and spins of supermassive black holes and quiescent galactic nuclei. Right now, we have trouble achieving that potential because of our lack of a first principles understanding of the hydrodynamics and the radiation. I'm, I, I would say I'm pretty optimistic that this will be solved in the next few years. Current generations of adaptive mesh refinement and moving mesh hydrocodes, to use somewhat technical vocabulary, are finally becoming capable of simulating the process of tidal disruption and the process of circularization without making the compromises that authors such as myself have, have had to make in the past. But uh, if you don't want to wait a few years for these ab initio simulations to emerge, it's worth thinking about aspects of the TD problem where relatively simple models can be applied in a trustworthy way. And these, these two corners of TD parameter space where I feel more confident applying the tools of standard accretion theory are at early times, observations taken in the soft X-rays. And thanks to Danny's question, I think I've already explained my reasoning there. The, the soft X-ray emission comes from, it, it's very hard to get this to come from anywhere except immediately outside the event horizon. The matter that is native to these scales has gone through orders of magnitude of dissipation in energy, from, from energies consistent with GM over a thousand Schwarzschild radii to energies consistent with GM over one Schwarzschild radii. 
whatever dissipation process brought matter that deep into the potential well, very likely uh, circularized it. And you can see hints for this in even after six days of the simulation I showed you a few minutes ago, the color coding on, on this uh, snapshot of the simulation refers to the eccentricity of the stellar debris in a particular projected look down into the orbital plane. And you can see that at the center, even after just six days of evolution, the material has substantially circularized from initial eccentricities of 0.99 following disruption down to eccentricities of 0.6 or so. Admittedly, 0.6 is not zero, but this is also just after six days of evolution. Um, so at, at early times, both extrapolations of existing first principle simulations, as well as attempts to fit the actual observed data, both point to the existence of a quasi-standard, quasi-circular accretion disk. At very late times, it also is reasonable to expect whatever excess energy existed at the beginning to have dissipated away. Here, I'm talking about 10 years after the disruption, where observational campaigns by my collaborator, Short Van Belzen, and myself have revealed the common existence of a late time far ultraviolet excess around the supermassive black holes that hosted TD outbursts five or 10 years ago. These late time UV excesses, again, are well fit by classic axisymmetric accretion disk models. They're very dim though, so I'm not going to talk about them in this talk. They're, they're, the, the theory behind them is probably simple, but the signal to noise ratios you get are, are, are not that strong. So instead, I'm going to focus on applications of fitting the early time X-ray emission. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go through this a little quickly, but essentially what my collaborators, Sixiang Wen, Peter Yonker, and Ann Zabladoff and I have done is to adapt the, the sort of standard tools of X-ray continuum fitting using a color-corrected multicolor black body accretion disk, color-corrected to reflect the effects of weak continentization in order to fit the continuum X-ray spectra that are observed and are generally observed to be quasi-thermal. When we do this and we apply this to real X-ray data from real TDs, we're able to put constraints in the joint parameter space of black hole mass, that's what's shown on the X-axis, and black hole spin, that's what's shown on the Y-axis. The colors are delta C statistics. You can think of them roughly as one sigma confidence contours in blue and two sigma confidence contours in purple. This is for one particular TD, Assassin 150i is the telephone number, where we had two different observing epochs with the XMM uh, X-ray observatory. As you can see, we're able to constrain the mass of the black hole to within a factor of a few. In this case, because we only had two observing epochs, we couldn't really say anything about the spin of the black hole. But when the data quality is higher, or, or really when we have more observations spanning more time, we're able to get meaningful joint constraints in this mass and spin plane. So for this better study title disruption event assassin 14 li, we're able to uh, constrain the spin as well as the mass. And the mass constraint gets much tighter as well. So what, is, what is actually being fit? What are, what are the data being fit? Um, so we have 10 epochs of XMM X-ray observations. Each epoch of observations has counts of X-ray photons in different bins of energy. We're simultaneously fitting all 10 epochs all the different bins of, of X-ray photons, requiring some parameters like black hole mass and black hole spin to be constant, but allowing other parameters like the accretion rate to, to float between epochs. And what we're fitting to the observations are general relativistic slim disk accretion models whose emergent weakly, compton weakly comptonized black body spectrum is passed through a GR ray tracing code so depending on the viewing angle, sometimes you get big lensing effects, sometimes you get weak lensing effects. The black body spectrum depends on the size of the last day of the world. Yes. So the, the main sensitivity to the spin comes from the fact that depending on the spin of the black hole, an accretion disk can't extend arbitrarily close to the event horizon. Eventually, stable circular orbits disappear. The point where they disappear depends strongly on the spin. And the point where they disappear is the hottest annulus of the accretion disk so it, it dominates more or less the X-ray emission. Good questions. Is the central dominant fit built up against S equals what? Sorry, the, so the, 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 the best fit is a spin of about 0.99. However, from a statistical perspective, that's indistinguishable from the rest of the blue region. So it's right up against the singularity. Um, not not the singularity per se, but right up against the event horizon, if if, if that's correct. But again, the black hole itself is very 
No, not exactly. So as, as the spin goes to one, as long as it stays less than one, the event horizon contracts to one gravitational radius. But that one gravitational radius for a supermassive black hole is still 10 to the 8 meters, 10 to the 9 meters. So you, there, there is still a, a large macroscopic separation between the event horizon and the singularity in the center. Um, go ahead. Maybe I should interrupt you some. So okay. <laughs> if, if, if you want to, you can. Um, I, I will say that this concludes the introduction to the astrophysics of TDs. If you want to learn more, I have a book to sell. Uh, <laughs> um, re recently, with uh, the help of Yair and, and other co-authors, we wrote what I think is the first textbook on TDs. Uh, so if, if any of the previous uh, 40 minutes intrigued you, I, I encourage you to, to look for this book when it's published next year. Um, okay, so... How rare are such events in which you have a so, so in a in a typical galaxy, they happen about once every ten thousand years. They're quite rare. You don't have to worry about the Milky Way having one in our lifetimes. Um, but with modern wide field astronomical surveys, we're able to stare at hundreds of thousands of galaxies at the same time. So even very rare events like this can be detected in in interesting numbers. For comparison, sort of the most the most common kind of astrophysical explosion, a, a supernova happens maybe once every 100 years in a Milky Way-like galaxy. So these happen at about 1% of the supernova rate. OK, now, in recent years, as our sample of TDs has grown and as theorists have become more free to speculate, uh, there have been various uh, ideas about ways that TDs can be used as astrophysical laboratories for more fundamental questions in physics. Some of these questions have to do with uh, astroparticle physics, by which, by, by which I mean explaining the kinds of high energy particle sources observed here on Earth with detectors like the ice cube experiment in Antarctica that has uncovered an astrophysical background of PEV energy neutrinos, or things like the Pierre Auger Observatory, which detects ultra high energy cosmic rays up to EEV energies. So in both cases, we have this very interesting background or population of super high energy particles impacting the Earth. And astrophysically, we don't really know where they're coming from. TDs are very high luminosity events. There are reasons to think they may be able to accelerate particles to relativistic speeds, especially in the subset of TDs I alluded to briefly that launch anisotropic relativistic jets. In these cases, there are longstanding models that astrophysicists use for understanding how jets can accelerate high energy particles. If you apply these models to what we know empirically about tidal disruption event jets, the picture for ultra high energy cosmic rays looks fairly promising, as has been pointed out by Glenis Farrer and my colleague Steve Piran at, at the Hebrew University. So in, although there's a lot we don't know about TD jets, from the limited information we do have, they appear uh, able to potentially explain the ultra high energy cosmic ray flux on Earth, as well as to evade various problems that exist for classic models like acceleration of the AGM jets. Until recently- Now you're talking about charge, but these are charged particles, that's right. Not the neutrinos. The neutrinos, all right, so, so the, the simple models for particle acceleration in relativistic jets involve the acceleration of, of charged particles to ultra-relativistic energies. But, but if these charged particles interact with each other, then they're capable of producing uh, ultra-high energy neutrinos as well. So if for, for example, if, if, if you have yeah, some, some sort of proton-proton collision or, or you make a pion and then the pion decays, but the pion's energy was uh, EEV to begin with, you're going to get a very high energy uh, uh, cascade out of that. Um, okay, until recently, I think theorists have been much more pessimistic about explaining the PEV neutrino background seen by IceCube. But in the last year, there have actually been two discoveries where a high energy neutrino of energy roughly 10% of a peta electron volt was discovered in temporal, and to the extent we can say it, spatial coincidence with an ongoing tidal disruption event. So there's increasing reason to think that uh, earlier predictions, like this plot on the right, whose axes have disappeared, sorry about that, were, were too pessimistic about the neutrino luminosity of, of TDs. And there may really be Where empirical evidence. Wait, know where it came from? So with with both, you know, from which galaxy, yeah, not from a specific galaxy, but but you 
you are able to point to a direction on the sky that contains a large number of galaxies. And by associating the spatial and temporal coincidence of the neutrino with the spatial and temporal coincidence of this very rare electromagnetic flare, you can ask yourself if it's a significant, a, a significant association. And recent papers have claimed that these are significant associations. I'm not on these papers, so I, I can't speak to the statistical analysis myself, but it appears very uh, intriguing. Um, there may also be uh, a role that TDs have to play as multi-messenger sources for gravitational waves. You can ask me about that later if you're interested. Okay, now I'm going to come back to Amiel's question, as well as what TDs can teach us about fundamental aspects of general relativity. If you think about the problem of tidal disruption in a purely Newtonian way, the tidal radius, the radius where the tidal field of the black hole exceeds the self-gravity of the star, can be written as basically the radius of the star, r star, times the cube root of the mass ratio. The cube root comes from the fact that tides in Newtonian gravity are one over r cubed force. If you look at this expression, you see that the tidal radius goes as a weak power of the black hole mass. It goes as black hole mass to the one third but the size of the event horizon is linear in the black hole mass, as we all remember from our GR or astrophysics courses. So what that means is if I take a galaxy and I turn my knob to make the black hole bigger and bigger, eventually the event horizon will swallow the tidal radius. The tidal radius will move inside the event horizon and it will become impossible to have an electromagnetically luminous tidal disruption event. Stars won't be torn apart until they're already inside the event horizon of the black hole and are causally disconnected from observers here on Earth. You can repeat, and so if you equate these two radii in Newtonian gravity or in the Schwarzschild metric, the critical mass you get is about nine times 10 to the seven solar masses, which as you might remember, is right in the logarithmic middle of the supermassive black hole mass spectrum, which extends from a million solar masses to 10 billion solar masses. So this Newtonian calculation implies that a large fraction of the supermassive black holes in the universe should be incapable of making electromagnetically bright TDs. You can repeat this calculation more exactly by taking uh, an, an orthonormal tetrad, projecting the Riemann tensor onto it, getting a relativistic tidal tensor. You can ask me about these details later. What you find is that this critical mass, which is called the Hill's mass, depends very sensitively on the spin of the black hole. And in fact, it increases by almost an order of magnitude as you go from a non-spinning Schwarzschild black hole to a near extremal Kerr metric black hole with a dimensionless spin parameter A that is very close to one. We applied this kind of calculation to one very exciting electromagnetic transient, uh, Assassin 15LH about six years ago. So depending on who you ask, this was either the brightest supernova ever observed or the brightest tidal disruption event ever observed. I, the jury is still out, although I, I clearly have my favorite uh, opinion. When, when this transient was originally detected, the observers who found it discounted the TD explanation. And the reason they discounted it was that even though this enormous flare was from the center of a quiescent galaxy that was not undergoing any observable star formation, something you usually need for supernovae explosions, the mass for the supermassive black hole that you get from the M-sigma relationship is of order of five or six times 10 to the eight. The one sigma error range on the M sigma mass of the supermassive black hole is the shaded gray region in this plot. So it's at least a few times 10 to the eight, maybe even more than 10 to the nine solar masses. And this is way above the, the Hill's mass for mean sequence stars to be disrupted by, or for, for low mass mean sequence stars to be disrupted by a, a non-spinning black hole. By doing this more exact relativistic calculation, what we showed is that if you crank the spin parameter up, you actually can comfortably get disruption of one solar mass and even 0.3 solar mass stars, as long as this black hole is rapidly spinning. Okay, this is what it means to think about the Hill's mass for an individual event. But things get even more exciting when you think about populations of TDs, all of which have their own black hole mass measurements, or at least approximate black hole mass estimates. The reason for this is that if you take a population of TDs and you bin them up, in terms of the, the, the mass of the responsible black hole, a super exponential cutoff in the TDE rate is inevitable somewhere between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9 solar masses, as long as the massive dark objects in galactic nuclei, which we think are black holes, 
really are black holes with an event horizon. Let me step back and say that one more time. As long as the massive dark objects whose, whose masses we can measure with stellar dynamics that appear to be ubiquitous in, in galactic nuclei are really well-behaved black holes with an event horizon, there's no way to evade this smoking gun super exponential cutoff that is a clear signature of the tidal disruption process. Even more interestingly, aside from being able to use this, which I'll get to in a second, to validate my, my claim that most of what we're calling TDs really are TDs, this offers us a, a unique astrophysical laboratory to test the weak cosmic censorship conjecture. So for those of you who haven't taken GR in a while, there are various problems that emerge, deterministic problems, causal problems, when you have space-time singularities that are not hidden behind an event horizon. For example, if you take the simple Kerr metric and ask what happens, if the spin becomes greater than one, you wind up with closed time-like curves that are exposed to future null infinity. In other words, you have grandfather paradoxes. And since physicists don't know how to solve these any better than Hollywood does, <laughs> most professional general relativists conjecture that all singularities in the universe are hidden behind event horizons. But this conjecture has never been theoretically proven. And since astrophysical black holes exist, or we think they exist, it's ultimately an empirically testable hypothesis that can be tested with a statistical sample of TDs. Uh, this, this, this basic idea was first investigated at some level in a, a, a brilliant paper by Mike Kesden in 2012. What I'll now show you is a look at, at current data. So, so this is a paper, uh, an observational paper from Short Van Belgen showing the predicted super exponential cutoff. We have a drop in the inferred TD rate by five orders of magnitude as you go to high mass galaxies with supermassive black holes above the Hill's mass. So um, th this I think is the, the clearest evidence that observers like Yair are doing something pretty right when they, they see flashes of light from the centers of galaxies and they say, aha, this is, this is a tidal disruption event. It doesn't prove that every claim TD is a TD, but it proves that as a class of events, we, we seem to be getting th uh, things correct at, at leading order. That's not I, a What's that? It's not a detection issue. It's not a detection issue. Um, I, I would say that, I, I would say probably not, but I'm almost out of time. So let's save that for a little later. Here's, um, here's a more recent uh, uh, look at, at some work in prep from, from Van Belzen and myself, where we basically repeat this calculation, thinking about different distributions of black hole spin in the universe and comparing that to a model where instead of having well-behaved spinning black holes with event horizons, we just have naked singularities, which we assign the masses of the, the supermassive black holes that astronomers think they understand. And as you can see, this, this data is consistent with a wide range of supermassive black hole spins. As we get more data, we'll narrow down this range of black hole spins that exists between 10 to the 8 and 10 to the 9 solar masses. But it's already quite inconsistent with the alternative idea that we have a lot of naked singularities in the centers of galaxies. All right. Um, so this is one test of fundamental physics I'm, uh, I'm very excited about with TDs. But we have a lot of questions, and I, I think I'm just about out of time. So unfortunately, the second test of fundamental physics, which is using this so-called super radiant scattering instability to rule out the existence of ultralight scalar or vector bosons, you'll have to ask me about later. So in, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to skip ahead to the, the conclusions. But as I, as I do this, I will mention very briefly that by measuring the spins of supermassive, or by measuring the spins of any black hole, you can rule out the existence of, in nature of ultralight scalar or vector bosons whose Compton wavelength is comparable to the size of the event horizon. If such ultralight bosons existed, they would undergo repeated super radiant scatterings and spin down the black hole over an astrophysically short time scale. Existing measurements of black hole spin from stellar mass black holes and from supermassive black holes rule out certain ranges of ultralight boson masses, 10 to the minus 17 eV to 10 to the minus 19 eV, 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 13, with a big gap in the middle corresponding to the, the intermediate mass black hole mass range. If you're interested, I will make the case to you later that using a TD, we have the first ever spin measurement 
of an intermediate mass black hole, which is this blue dot here, which can be used to rule out an entirely different range in ultralight boson masses, complementing this technique, which has been applied to, to other kinds of black holes in the past. Okay, but since I'm out of time, I'll just put up a few conclusions and we can talk about whatever you find interesting later. In summary, over the next few years, our sample of TDs is gonna grow from the tens into the thousands, thanks to LSST, E-Rosita, and Ultrasat as well. TDs are potentially uh, the perfect probes to measure the masses and spins of black holes in the universe, to learn about astrophysics from this, and even to test aspects of fundamental physics. For now, our ability to make full use of this incoming flood of data is somewhat limited by our lack of first principles understanding of the hydrodynamics of this problem. But even without a detailed understanding of the hydrodynamics, there are still things we can point out, like this shadow of the horizon in the Hill's mass that will enable us to learn very interesting things about masses, spins, and even fundamental physics. So uh, I'll, I'll leave this up here. And um, if you have any other questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them now. So the, the plot with the mass distribution. Uh, with the event horizon? Yes. Yeah, this yeah. one. Well, the one, the next one. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's really, I mean, I think this is fantastic. It's, Thanks. Uh, you know, this is this is real physics, right? You're, you're measuring something here. Oh, I think so. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's what we want. But but it says that this is this is based on twelve events. It's not a huge number yet. But how can you do this with twelve events? You know, how can you see a a four or five order of magnitude? That, 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 that's a good question. And uh, there, there is an important caveat to this data point, which is that this is Assassin 15LH. It has a multiple order of magnitude drop in its volumetric event rate because it's more than an order of magnitude brighter than your typical TD. So in our current flux limited TD sample, which is something you need to correct, you need to correct for the flux limitations of your sample in order to go from detections to volumetric event rates, a super bright flare like Assassin 15LH will be associated with a very low per volume rate. Um, now, now I, I should mention that even if you're a skeptic that Assassin 15LH is a TD, which I mean, I, I would disagree with, but I, I would respect your skepticism, losing this data point would just turn this into an upper limit. Right. So, so the basic, aspect of this argument would not change. And that, that upper limit would be even lower. Um, yes, I, I guess it, it would become somewhat lower. But then, and then the other three points are based on like three or four events each. That, that's right. And, and one thing I should point out, this is what you can do with 12 TDs. In the not, in the not too distant future, we'll have hundreds or thousands. Uh, yeah, so I, I think if, if we start seeing tidal disruption events from galaxies with M87-like black holes, that's a, a very hard thing to explain. Mm -hmm. But we haven't yet. <laughs> So, when, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> so when you see, um, you know, when you model the X-ray uh, <coughs> spectrum, if you're pushing this, this uh, and, and deduce the mass and the spin. Mm -hmm. So is, is this any different from what people have been doing uh, for many years for AGNs? Um, it's it's closer to what's done for X-ray binaries. Um, so so. Most, almost all AGN spin measurements I'm aware of, and the, the expert in the audience should correct me if I'm getting this wrong, measure the spins in, of supermassive black holes in AGN using a relativistically broadened iron emission line. We're not doing that uh, in, in part because that's never or almost never been seen in a TDE. But one reason we're not doing that is that unlike most AGN, 
we have access to the thermal vein tail of the of the multicolor black body accretion disk. The spectra of of, uh, of TDs look gen, in X rays generally look like the high soft state of an X ray binary, where people like Jeff Jeff McClintock or Ramesh and Orion have been doing this kind of continuum fitting for for a long time. Um, th this has been done to a limited extent in AGN. I know Chris Doan has has done a little continuum fitting in AGN, but almost all spin measurements I'm aware of in AGN use the, the geometry of this iron Don't line. Do you see the same soft condition in AGN? And if not, why not? So, accretion disk and accretion disk, regardless of what you're used to, whether it's accretion from gas or from sun. TDs preferentially occur around the smallest mass black holes that have a high occupation fraction in galaxies. They also have very high Eddington ratios, at least at the beginning of the flare. Those two factors increase the temperature of the, the gas at the innermost stable circular orbit. And you, you, you're, the, the peak temperature is still in the extreme ultraviolet, which is unobservable. For non-astronomers, that's because the Milky Way is opaque to these wavelengths. Um, but by increasing the temperature, you're pushing the observable soft X-ray band closer and closer to the peak. Um, in AGN, in general, you have higher mass black holes and lower Eddington ratios. The temperature is lower and you're further away from the, you're further down the exponential detail. Do you have time to say a few words about that proposed intermediate mass black hole? Uh, I would love to if, uh, <laughs> if, if people here have, uh, have time. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, mention that there was a, a TD candidate found in a tiny dwarf galaxy or possibly oversized star cluster orbiting a much larger lenticular galaxy. So the TD went off here. It was observed over a period of years in the X-rays. And by fitting our accretion disk models, which, I, which I've described, to five different epochs of X-ray observations, we're able to make the same kinds of constraints on the mass and spin plane. Our fiducial constraints are shown in the left panel. And in our fiducial constraints, you can see that this is clearly a black hole in the intermediate mass range. It's of order one to two times 10 to the four times the mass of the sun. And we get a pretty strong spin constraint also. And that strong spin constraint is what is useful for ruling out the existence of ultralight bosons in, in resonance with this mass. Um, however, one very important caveat is that there, the host star cluster is actually too dim to get a redshift up for. So we estimated the probability of a chance coincidence that the host cluster is some distant background or, or nearby foreground object, and it's low. But if we remain agnostic on the redshift of the host cluster and allow that to float as a free parameter that we fit, we get this kind of constraint here instead. So if, if we are agnostic about the redshift of the host cluster, we can still confirm this is definitely an intermediate mass black hole. However, our beautiful spin constraint does go away. So we, we actually had observing time with Magellan to try to do better and to get that redshift. Then the Magellan observation was canceled because of COVID last year. Um, so I, I, th this is, I think, an answerable question, but it, it hasn't been answered yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.